Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Super excited for this video as we're going to break down my 2023-2024 NBA season awards finalists and who I would actually vote to win each award. I'm super excited for this one. I hope you are as well. Remember, we have the Clutch Player of the Year award in here as well. And of course, all of the usual ones, Depoy, MVP, Sixth Man, all of the good stuff. So this is gonna be a fun video. I wanna know down in the comment section below who you have winning each award. Let me know down in the comment section. Comment as we go so that you don't forget to comment a specific award winner that you want to share with me. I'll be reading every single comment just like I do for every other single video on the channel. Really excited. Again, if you enjoy make sure to leave a like and subscribe. And let's jump into it here now with our Clutch Player of the Year award. And my two finalists for it, DeJounte Murray of the Atlanta Hawks and Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors. Now you could also make a case for someone like Anthony Edwards who's had some phenomenal clutch moments. There have been a ton of clutch moments throughout the season, but these two have stood out to me the most at this point. DeJounte Murray had a stretch of games where it just felt like he was hitting a game winner on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every single night of the week, basically. It felt like DeJounte Murray was hitting game winners. And Steph Curry, remember he had a game winner earlier in the in-season tournament this year. He's had some memorable moments. Think back to their overtime games uh, with the Los Angeles Lakers. Steph Curry's had a bunch of clutch moments this year and he's been brilliant all season long. Now DeJounte Murray, from an anecdotal evidence standpoint, maybe stands out a little bit above Steph Curry, but Curry, some of the numbers suggest that he's been a little bit better in the clutch this season. So how do you want to look at this award? Do you want it to be the game winner award or do you want it to be the final five minutes of a tight game award? And I think there's really no real way to look at it. There's no correct option here. But for me specifically, I opted to go with Steph Curry winning the award this year, the Clutch Player of the Year Award. De'Aaron Fox won it in the inaugural season and the award stays in California here with Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors. Again, let me know down in the comment section below who you think deserves some of these accolades as we go. One quick thing, I'm not doing all defense or all NBA in this video. That is going to be its own separate video that will come out one day after this video does. So I'm excited for that one as well. We're gonna break down a lot more in that video moving forward. Coach of the Year Award. I've got Jamal Mosley of the Orlando Magic, Chris Finch of the Minnesota Timberwolves, and Mark Dagnalt of the Oklahoma City Thunder as my three finalists. Another candidate I wanted to consider was Joe Missoula, although I left him off of my finalists here simply for the fact that his team is super stacked. So while he has the most wins in the NBA and I think a very good candidate for this award, these three stood out to me given the context of their situations and how I think that they've maybe even overperformed with their roster to a certain extent. Now, Chris Finch, I think he actually has a loaded roster. I have maintained that position ever since the Rudy Gobert trade. If you go back uh, a couple off seasons ago, I even had a video saying that the Rudy Gobert trade was genius for the Minnesota Timberwolves. And I feel like that has aged extremely well, especially with how this season has played out for Minnesota, uh, the best defense in the league. And Chris Finch is the one who has engineered that to a certain extent. It doesn't hurt though, having multiple all defense caliber players and Jaden McDaniels, Rudy Gobert, who we might talk about later in this video, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing there. Also having Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Anthony Edwards. This team is loaded with defensive talent, but Finch, he's the orchestrator. He still does deserve some credit for that. They have been around or at the top of the Western Conference for a majority of this season. Jamal Mosley, really a great feel-good story for the Magic this year. I think they've overperformed expectations. I don't think anyone was really expecting them to be a top three or four seed in the Eastern Conference. Now it is extremely bunched together. So a couple losses here and there down the final couple of games of the season. And all of a sudden you might be looking at what is a completely different outlook on their seeding. I, at the end of the day, I don't really care about the seeding too much. That's not going to influence me drastically but the Orlando Magic have just been fantastic this season. A really strong defense. He's gotten a bunch of young players to buy into winning habits on the defensive end of the floor. He's been able to orchestrate a quality enough offense, even with some of their limitations from a roster construction standpoint at this point. So Jamal Mosley, someone who is an extremely bright 
uh, younger NBA head coach. He's done a fantastic job with that team ever since he stepped foot in Orlando, in my opinion. And now he's starting to really reap the benefits as the talent level kind of grows to where his coaching level's at, which is really, really, really good. Mark Dagnalt, another great example of that with the Oklahoma City Thunder. For me, his candidacy is not just built upon this year where, yes, he has a real shot at it, a really legitimate case because of how fantastic the Thunder have been. But when you also consider the fact that this has been brewing, his kind of identity, his play style, his scheme has been breeding results for years for Oklahoma City, even when they were even more talent deficient uh, in years past, before Chet Holmgren debuted, before Jalen Williams arrived and has grown into the star that we know him to be today. Oklahoma City's been competitive. Even when they tank down the stretch of the season, they get close to 35, 40 wins. Last year, they had 40 on the nose. This year, they have heavily surpassed that. Coming into the year, they were a team I expected to finish top four in the Western Conference. They have now locked that up, clinched a playoff spot, a home playoff spot that is as well. So they'll have home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. It's an extremely young team, but Mark Dagnalt has been a fantastic, not only leader, but coach. He's one of the more innovative X's and O's minds in the in the league today. Does a really great job utilizing small to small screens, a lot of different unique things in their offense that is very, again, creative, innovative, whatever adjective you want to use. It probably describes Mark Dagnalt if it's a positive one. And for that reason, he is my 2023-2024 Coach of the Year. Finch, Mosley, both have done fantastic jobs, but I think the job Dagnalt has done not only this season, but over the last couple of years to get his team to this point with the youth on that roster has just been so impressive. And for that reason, he should be the 2023-2024 Coach of the Year. Moving on to the Most Improved Player Award, and I've got three guards in here. Cam Thomas of the Brooklyn Nets, who has significantly increased his points per game outburst this season, kind of living up to what I saw out of him at LSU a few years back when he was playing alongside Trenton Watford in the SEC. Tyrese Maxey, who I think everyone foresaw a huge jump this season, given the absence of James Harden now in Philadelphia. The ball was placed into Maxey's hands. He has taken a huge jump forward in terms of his actual scoring. His assist numbers have skyrocketed, and he's even been been able to keep Philadelphia afloat during the Embiid absence. Now they weren't great without Embiid. It's hard to be great without your best player, but Maxi has done a great job all season long, at least keeping Philadelphia competitive with Embiid on the shelf. And now that Embiid's back, the Sixers still are a real threat in the postseason. And then Kobe White, I think one of the awesome surprises this year of the season. I know he played well down the stretch of last season. The hard thing is games in late March and early April aren't always indicative of what's going to happen going into future seasons. Think about Malachi Flynn dropping 50 points just the other night. Now, obviously, Malachi Flynn is no Kobe White. I'm not trying to suggest that. But there's a lot of crazy outlier performances down the back you know, 10, 15 games of the season. But Kobe White this year has stepped into a bigger role with a lot more responsibility. And because of that, he has just thrived. I feel like he's been playing in a rhythm. He has confidence about himself now that he not only belongs in the league, but he belongs to have the ball in his hand and make plays, make decisions, and to shoot the basketball. And that's always been his big strength coming out of UNC. He's a shooter. And he has done that at an extremely high level this year. Because of that, he is my most improved player of the year over Cam Thomas, who has a very similar uh, point per game increase. I just think Cam Thomas, a lot of that comes from his minutes increase, which was a little bit more stark than Kobe White's. I think White has actually improved a bit more from an actual technical standpoint. And then when you look at someone like Tyrese Maxey, I think he was capable of this. I think we all knew he was going to be someone who was able to take on greater responsibility. Now he's executed on that. He's done a fantastic job. There's no denying that. But in the spirit of the award, I think Kobe White's a little bit more deserving in this most improved player of the year cycle. Moving on to rookie of the year, and it's really a two-man race. And what a battle it was, especially at the beginning of the season. And I really want to use this segment here to highlight Chet Holmgren and how fantastic of a rookie season he has had. What he has been doing is not normal. The efficiency, the scoring, the defensive impact especially. He's a real candidate for all defense this season because he is that good of a young player. Now, he is a little bit older than Victor Wembanyama, obviously. 
uh, 21 years old and a draft class prior to Victor sat out his actual rookie season uh, almost like a redshirt rookie this year but he has been phenomenal and I don't want to kind of jump over that fact you know I'm one of the biggest believers in Victor Wembanyama I have been for a long time you guys know all last draft cycle, I was singing from the mountaintop how fantastic Wembenyama was going to be as a player and someone who I deemed to be an all-star caliber player in his rookie season, which I think he's lived up to. But Chet Holmgren wasn't far off from that either. A player who, he is really at the identity and at the crux of OKC's play style, which is something that, honestly, the writing was on the wall there with the way they were playing Mike Muscala as their center in previous seasons. The upgrade to Chet Holmgren, it has just unlocked everything about the way that they play. The ability to put the ball in the deck, drive and kick, open up driving lanes, the ability to pass off of a live dribble. Chet Holmgren does all of that while still anchoring a defense and shooting the three ball at an elite clip. I almost said Trey Ball. I was trying to channel my inner Chet Holmgren there. He's just been fantastic. But I think the clear and obvious award winner here is Victor Wembanyama. He's an absolute cheat code. A player that we'll never ever see again in NBA history probably. He's a one of one prospect, a true alien, somebody who, as I have said for the last year plus on the channel, maybe about two years now on the channel actually, he is an incredible player. Not a prospect at this point, an incredible player. He is somebody who, as soon as next season will be on all NBA teams, he will win multiple defensive players of the year. He is a player that is so good that he makes someone as good as Chet Holmgren look a little outmatched, which is unbelievable because again, Chet, I think the ceiling is so high with him. And I loved him during his draft class, during the 2022 NBA draft class. I talked at length about how awesome of a prospect Chet was and how good he was going to be in the NBA. And Victor has just completely supplanted that. He's been a much better player for a very long time and he is going to continue to get better he is the easy choice here for Rookie of the Year with no discredit to Chet Holmgren whatsoever. Six Man of the Year. This is a fun one. We've got two candidates here yet again. I wanted to include some others, but I really just do think it's a two-man race. If you look at the betting odds right now, it is between Malik Monk and Nas Reed. And there's a couple of positives for Nas Reed that he has an advantage here over Malik Monk. First of all, he has more games played than Malik Monk. Monk, who obviously sustained a season-ending injury ultimately for at least the regular season just a couple of weeks ago, is locked in at 72 games played. Now, he was extremely productive in those 72 games, but will the voters look at Nasri playing nearly 80 or 80 plus games and give the edge for that reason? You also have to look at Nasri being kind of a unique situation here. Typically, when you look at six men candidates, they are electric shot-making guards like Malik Monk. Nas Reed, well, he's a guard in a center's body, standing at about six foot ten. He's a very unique sixth-man candidate compared to what we normally see. I think the most recent example of a big man winning the sixth man of the year award was Montrez Harrell back with the Los Angeles Clippers. Of course, that bench mob unit with him and Lou Williams was devastating for teams. That's what Nas Reed has been all season long for Minnesota. From an actual six-man perspective, though, Nas Reed has been starting games in the absence of Carl Anthony Towns that has also helped him kind of boost some of his actual averages this season. He does play less minutes per game than Malik Monk, but his efficiency far outweighs Malik Monk. He's also been, I think, you know, really able to play off the catch and adapt to playing off of others. Monk obviously does very well playing off of Sabonis, but I think Nas Reed in the pecking order there in Minnesota, he's quite a bit lower. But when you look at Malik Monk, he's got a huge advantage as well. He's been a true sixth man the entire season. He has literally willed the Kings to wins, uh, including real clutch performances. Another player who has just stolen the show at the end of games. And a player who does a lot from the playmaking perspective that Nas Reed does not. Averages over four assists more per game, uh, four more assists per game than Nas Reed. And you're looking, uh, when you consider Malik Monk here too, obviously his efficiency is a bit lower, but he creates a lot of those shots for himself off the dribble. So for that reason, with what he brings to the Kings offense, I elected to give him my sixth man of the year vote this year over Nas Reed, even though I think Reed, an excellent player, has been hugely pivotal for the Minnesota Timberwolves this year. Without him, they would not be the team that they are. But 
Malik Monk, you can say the same thing about him for Sacramento. The Kings have desperately needed him at times this year, and he has come through, including in head-to-head matchups against the Minnesota Timberwolves, where he's been at times truly devastating as well. Then you look at the defensive player of the year landscape, and I landed on three big men here. Shout out to Herb Jones, though. Probably wouldn't vote him for defensive player of the year, but he will definitely be an all-defense team candidate. Make sure to, again, check out that video once it comes out on the channel a day after this one. Anthony Davis, Victor Wembanyama, and Rudy Gobert are my three finalists for defensive player of the year, and there's all really great cases for all of them. Anthony Davis, you could argue, is maybe just the most versatile defensive player on this list. Extremely switchable, someone who's great in drop coverage, someone who's a great hedge and recover big man, and a fantastic rim protector to boot. He does a lot of great things for the Lakers, who have really relied on him this season. He's been an ultimate great two-way player for them. There's a real argument that he's been the best player in the Lakers this season, which I haven't been able to say about him in years past. But with with uh, LeBron's slight decline, Anthony Davis playing probably the best basketball of his career. I think there's a, a legitimate argument to that, that AD has been the best player on the Lakers this season. Then you have the real race between the Frenchmen between Rudy Gobert and Victor Wembanyama. Wembanyama towers over the competition with stature, but in this race, I'm not sure that he does quite yet. I still think there's areas for Victor to improve defensively. I think right now, he's a little jump happy. He gets himself out of position going for blocks. And listen, blocks are a great thing. So are steel stocks. That's a great statistic and something you want to be fantastic and you want to lead the league in stocks. And that's exactly what Wembanyama is doing. But and we got to pump the brakes here just a little bit. You know, I'm the biggest advocate for Victor Wembanyama. I called him the greatest prospect I've ever seen play any sport. I think he's an unbelievable player, and I think there's a lot in his future. I think he's going to be a six, seven-time Defensive Player of the Year winner, which would set him apart from anyone else in NBA history, but he's not getting his first one this season. I think Rudy Gobert, who has anchored the league's best uh, defense all season long, Without him, the Timberwolves just are not the same team on the defensive end. Now, I know if you look at the Spurs without Wemby, their net rating and defensive rating looks way different. I understand that argument. And again, I'm one of the biggest believers in Victor Wembanyama long term. I think this kid is going to go down as one of the greatest of all time. That was where I was on him uh, during my pre-draft evaluation. Looked at him as a surefire Hall of Famer, which is extremely high praise. But when it comes to Rudy Gobert, I just think he's been the better defender this season. Uh, You look at all of his defensive tracking numbers, uh, contesting on all three levels. Uh, Teams are really struggling to score at the rim against him. I think he's still the best rim deterrent in the league at this point. But Wembenyama's right there. Wembenyama's the future. But right now, the present belongs to Rudy Gobert. He will win his fourth defensive player of the year this season. Extremely well-deserved. Uh, and goes down in history tying both Dikembe Mutombo and Ben Wallace for the most defensive players of the year in NBA history. Then we get to the cream of the crop, the bread and butter here, the MVP award, and who do I have winning? Four finalists here. I wanted to throw Jalen Brunson in here. He's not going to win the award. He's not at the top of my list for the MVP but he has been balling another 45 point performance. He has just been tremendous for the New York Knicks, not just since they signed him, but especially this year with all of their injuries, OG Ananobi missing so much time, uh, Mitchell Robinson missing so much time, Julius Randle now seemingly out for the season. It just looks like this team, which should have been decimated by injuries, is still hovering around the top two or three seeds in the Eastern Conference. And the reason is two words, and those words are Jalen Brunson. He has been phenomenal, unreal efficiency. He competes on the defensive end of the floor. He is really the heart and soul. He's the heartbeat of the New York Knicks, and I've been extremely impressed not only with his growth since leaving Dallas, but his continued dominance despite being the number one on the scouting report, getting doubled. The way that he operates on and off the basketball, he has just taken his game to another level. So shout out to Jalen Brunson. Though, when we get down to three, I think there is one kind of odd man out here, and that is Shea Gilgis-Alexander. 
SGA has been, again, phenomenal. He is at the lifeblood of the way Oklahoma City plays. Drive and kick basketball. He leads the NBA in drives. He is essential for not only the way that they play, but they're winning. Without him, they would not nearly be the team that he is. He does put a lot of value on the table for the Oklahoma City Thunder. And if you're finishing top three in my MVP candidacies here, there's no shade. You're, I'm talking about some of the best players in the entire world, and Shea Gilgis Alexander belongs in that category. I've been for years praising him, saying he's an all NBA caliber player back before he ever got one, saying he's an all star level player before he ever was named an all star, and now I'm saying he's a true MVP candidate before he's ever finished as a finalist for the MVP. He is that good of a player. He belongs in the conversation. He's a joy to watch play. He does a lot of really great things in the basketball court. He's a mid-range assassin, drives the ball so well without really kind of ever passing that line of being too ball dominant. I think he just does a great job letting the game come to him and he plays the game the right way. Now we get to the final two. Luka Doncic, Nikola Jokic, great friends off the court, rivals on the court, rivals for this award this season. Jokic a two-time winner, Doncic has yet to win the award, and I think there's great cases for both of them. Nikola Jokic, probably just flat out the best player in the world. You look at the way that he has improved as a defensive player this season, he has taken tremendous strides from where he was even a year ago, right before lifting up the Larry O'Brien trophy. I still think he's taken huge steps forward this season while still being an offensive dominant force. No one can really guard him. One-on-one, -on -one, he is just too strong, too physical, with too much touch. He just dominates on the inside, but we know his playmaking feel and just how great of a player he is. And then on the other end, when you look at the word value and what does this guy provide to his team, well, he leads the league in uh, points plus assists plus rebounds, uh, I think, in NBA history. So he's been the most productive player, you could argue, in the history of the NBA from a points, rebounds, assist standpoint now that's not the best way of always looking at things but it is the reality and it stands out to me i don't think this team would be anywhere near where they are they're a solid team they've been playing really great as of late kyrie irving has stepped up big time but luka Doncic, in my opinion is the most valuable player in the 2023-2024 season now it doesn't necessarily mean i think he's the best player i would say Jokic is the best player as of today april 10th but I still think that when it comes to value, what Doncic provides to Dallas is undeniable. It's a toss up here between Jokic and Doncic. I'm not mad about either result, but I think Doncic with what he's doing, setting NBA history, he had a 73 point game this season. He has just been otherworldly. And I think when you look at the fact that he leads the NBA in 35 point games, 40 point games, 45 point games, 50 point games, 55 point games, 60 point games, so on and so forth. You're looking at one of the most dominant players the league has ever seen from an, a statistical output. Now I know defensively at times he's lackluster, but some of his tracking numbers suggest he's done a decent job this year. I definitely think he's been better than years past. So shout out to Doncic for coming in this season with, I think, a little bit better focus on the defensive end of the floor and also just being in better shape. The Mavericks have been defending extremely well as a team lately. I think Doncic's effort and focus level is at the middle of that. And then I also think just what he's been able to do offensively, the consistency with which he scores 30 plus points. He's had 20 plus I, th I think 21 now, 21, 20 plus first quarter scoring night. So he's coming out and just dominating teams from the jump. Everyone knows that what's coming and they still can't stop it. He's been lights out from three this season. And for that reason, he's the MVP of the league in my eyes this year. I hope you guys really did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to leave a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for more content. Let me know down in the comment section below who you think should win each award. Again, I'm going to be reading through all those comments. All NBA and all defense video coming out soon. Stay tuned for that and we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.